thank you very much for coming. End of the semester, end of the day. It's a wonderful opportunity uh, for us to gather uh, for this um, lecture on the global impact, not lecture, conversation on the global impact uh, revolution. You know, the impact investing um, and um, social enterprise entrepreneurship, um, these are fields that our students, uh, faculty in the broader Columbia community, I think are really engaging on numerous dimensions. Um, we have students here specializing in management and social enterprise. We have courses on these subjects. We have venture competitions, impact. Uh, student associations, faculty undertaking research on impact measurement. And these terms, impact, impact measurement, these are very elastic terms. They mean very different things um, and continue to evolve. What do we know? Uh, what's working? Uh, what's not working? Um, these are questions, I think, that as a school of public policy with a strong um, economics core um, and um, faculty and students who are thinking of both private sector, public sector um, uh, applications um, find uh, the opportunity to have this conversation with you really tremendously uh, exciting. Um, so Ronald Cohen has really been a pioneer uh, in this area. Um, his work has had a tremendous consequence uh, globally and others are following his lead. And it, for nearly, I think, two decades, uh, Sir Ronald's work has really catalyzed efforts around the world uh, to drive uh, private capital to serve social and environmental objectives. He has many roles, as you know, uh, serving as chairman of the Global Steering Group for Impact Investment, uh, the Educational Outcomes Fund for Africa and the Middle East, the Portland Trust. He's the co-founder of Social Finance uh, UK uh, and Israel and co-founder and chair of the Bridges Fund Management and Big Society Capital. He also previously chaired the G8 Social Impact Investment Task Force, a UK Social Investment Task Force, and uh, in 2012 was the recipient of Rockefeller Foundation's Innovation Award for Social Finance um, when Judith Roden was president. And um, he's been very active uh, with his um, on Mater Harvard Business School, on the uh, boards, uh, the board of the Dean's Advisory uh, Group, and as well as a director of the Management Corporation. So we're truly invite, uh, delighted to have you here. After a lifetime also in venture capital as the co-founder of a very successful uh, venture firm in, in, in the <coughs> UK. And joining our conversation is our own Takatoshi Ito. Um, I see friends from the business school and other students from across campus who joined us now in 2015 as a professor of international public affairs, a renowned international economist, expert on international finance, macroeconomics, and the Japanese economy and Asian capital markets was a member of the Prime Minister's Council on um, Economic and Fiscal Policy, as well as having served uh, at the IMF. And is teaching a course, an uh, experimental course, perhaps, um, on impact investing, intention, fiduciary duty, and management. So with that, just by way of context, and with uh, mindful that this should be a conversation, especially given Sir Ronald's just getting off a plane to be with us, let me just start us off by inviting you to share a little bit about how you started, because I think one of your first initiatives, uh, a social impact bond um, in the United Kingdom, was really very dramatic in its conception and its consequences, really got tremendous attention, and it sort of started a whole movement. So if you would give us a little history in how you started and where you think this is today. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you so much. Uh, maybe I'll take. Thank you so much, uh, Dean Chena. Uh, you're going to have to hang on every word because I have to speak very softly. 
uh, I caught something on the, the plane. But thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with all of you. Can you hear me sufficiently? Um, it's a real pleasure to be here with all of you. I particularly enjoy uh, speaking with the students because I think it's your generation uh, that is going to take these efforts forward. And uh, they're going to change our world because our world needs changing. Uh, virtually nobody, whatever generation they're a part of, uh, believes that we can continue uh, to live and operate in the way uh, that we do. And we were just chatting uh, before we came in here about how remarkable it is to find very typically skeptical investment figures across the world now coming out and saying capitalism needs to change. And it isn't really a political statement in the sense that they are saying we need a new ideology. We can see the resurgence of uh, socialism in the United States, which is something which would have been unthinkable just a few years ago. But that isn't a step forward, that's a step backwards. That's harking back to things that seemed like solutions decades ago and didn't work. And so, to answer your question, Dean uh, Jaina, when I set off uh, nearly 20 years ago to look at the issue of poverty in Britain at the request of the British uh, government, I began to realize that the way in which our society deals with social and environmental issues is very strange because governments tend to invest in trying to find solutions, but governments aren't usually best placed to innovate. They have low appetite for risk. Risk of failure is you know, a very sensitive subject for politicians. The electoral cycle is necessarily short, and so efforts that are going to yield fruit after six or seven years uh, sometimes aren't particularly interesting for politicians. And then if you look at the way that philanthropy came in to try to help tackle social issues, the philanthropic model itself had had two consequences. Almost every not-for-profit was small, and almost every single one had no money. So the philanthropic model wasn't really being effective. And so I began to ask uh, myself the question, and we published a report asking more generally the question, how do we manage to tie investment to social issues? How do we go beyond philanthropy and beyond government spending? And it seemed to me then that it was possible to achieve a link between the two. And we published a, a report in 2000 that said, look, we need to create a new type of investment bank, a social investment bank, to innovate in the way in which we fund organizations that want to do good. I had been involved in the birth of the venture capital industry and the private equity industry. They were completely new concepts based on completely new thinking about risk and returns. Investors before that had tended to think in terms of returns alone. When risk thinking came in, incidentally, if from an academic institution from uh, Chicago University came the idea of risk thinking, you began to create new concepts that change the face of investment, the concept of diversification. And it was that concept of diversification 
which really meant you can include something that's riskier but gives even better returns relative to the risk than other uh, investments you have that opened the door to venture capital and private equity. So I'd been, I'd been through that and I realized that, that uh, mindsets change and that it ought to be possible to find mechanisms that would change the mindset with regard to investment flowing to tackle social issues. And so we created social finance in 2007 uh, and by 2010 with a team of 18 young people, same age as most of you here, we invented the social impact bond. And at the time, I thought, great, we've solved the issue of connecting a social purpose with investment money by linking the two. The more successful you are at preventing prisoners from going back to jail, kids from dropping out of school, uh, pre-diabetics from becoming diabetic, the homeless uh, from staying on the street and getting into the job, the better the return for investors. And you'll appreciate that it was overturning what was a received wisdom that you can measure nothing in the social area. And of course, it's true that you can't measure everything in the social area. So if you all try to measure an improvement in the life of a kid that drops out versus a kid that graduates, you would have quite a challenge to do it um, dependably. But measuring the number that drop out and the number that graduate, well, we could do that very easily. And then, as I continued to work on these issues and the first social impact bond began to be followed by others and the Rockefeller Foundation, which incidentally invented the term um, uh, impact investment in, in its meeting in Bellagio in 2007. The Rockefeller Foundation was one of the 17 investors in the first social impact bond. As I began to work internationally through the G8 task force, which uh, Prime Minister Cameron asked me to chair, <coughs> I realized something, as you were saying, Dean Jano, much more momentous was happening. Because what I heard from each one of the national advisory boards we had in the G7 countries, which, as you know, are the most industrialized countries of uh, the world, the US, the UK, uh, Germany, France, uh, Italy, uh, Japan, um, Canada, uh, and uh, Russia had been a member but not kicked out of the G8 soon after we started, but uh, we brought Australia in as a, an eighth country. What, uh, what came back as these different national advisory boards worked was, look, the world is changing. And it's changing in the direction that the social impact bond exemplified, signaled, if you like. It's changing because there's a generation of young people that wants more meaning in life than just making money. A generation that would like to find that meaning in improving other people's lives and improving the planet. But also, older people, as investors, as contributors to pension funds, we're beginning to send huge amounts of money in the direction of achieving social and environmental goals. So 
the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment, which started in 2006. By 2014, when we were reporting, had the $40 trillion worth of assets that had signed up to saying we have to take more than just financial considerations into account when making investment decisions. That figure today is nearly 100 trillion, by the way. And so we began to realize that the world was moving in the direction of optimizing risk, return, and impact. Making decisions on the basis not just of the financial return, but of the impact return. And the initial reaction to that was, oh, this must be a less effective way to invest. But what we see with the passage of time as impact investments take place is that actually the returns can be even better than if you just optimize two dimensions. And the reason is that when you introduce impact as a dimension, you affect the risk parameter because governments, talent, funders begin to move away from those who have negative consequences. And that's a real risk. So if you're a coal company and the world begins to think, that coal companies are bad, you're going to suffer. If you're a confectionery company selling products with too much sugar, uh, you're going to have the same thing. And the talent uh, is crucial in the development of a company, just as consumers are and financiers uh, are. So by bringing uh, impact into the equation, you begin to reduce the risk element of a company, which is its long-term ability to grow and deliver profits. But, and this I think is just what happened with venture capital and private equity. When we put on technology lenses in looking at investments, when you put on an impact lens in looking at investments, you discover new sets of investment opportunities. And I want to give you a very simple example uh, just to illustrate uh, what, I, what I mean. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. One is in the low-tech area and one is in the tech area. In the low-tech area, at Bridges Ventures, which we created in 2002, to invest just in the poorest 25% of Britain, with the aim of achieving half a normal venture return, 10 to 12%. In fact, we've delivered 17% net return, and that's in the top quartile of venture returns. We sat around the table and we said, look, people living in poorer areas have poorer health. Part of the reason they can't get exercise. They work on shifts work at weekends, and so on and so forth. They can't afford gyms. What if we created a company that um, provided gyms in poorer areas? How profitable could that be? And of course, you answer the question by defining a model that can be profitable. So it has to be big, it has to have high volume, because you're going to do it at a quarter of the price of a normal gym. You're going to be open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so you have higher occupation. You don't have a spa, a changing room, uh, or any other facilities, uh, but you have 200 brand new machines. Well, what's the result? You grow faster than a mainstream gym. You've tapped into latent demand at a lower price point, and you grow even faster. And then what happens? Every gym company wants to acquire you because you threaten them. In the event of a recession, what's going to happen? People are going to gravitate to lower-cost gyms. 
That's the low-tech example. Now I'm going to give you a fascinating high-tech example in which I'm currently involved. <coughs> so my wife is Israeli. Interestingly, I was born in Egypt and left Egypt as a refugee at uh, the age of 11 to go to Britain. Um, and uh, the deal with my wife, who is a filmmaker, is when the kids leave school, uh, we will move and spend more time in Israel, which uh, we, we, we have done. And so I've got involved, and I, Apex uh, had an office in Israel, which has been hugely uh, successful. And so I got involved in high-tech impact ventures. Now, there's a company I came across which illustrates brilliantly uh, the point I've been making. It set off with an impact objective. It wanted to help the aunt of one of the founders who was going blind. And the technology that the company had developed for driverless cars, a company called Mobileye, which they sold for $15 billion. Some of that technology was used to develop a pair of spectacles for the blind. What does that mean? That means you put on these spectacles, you have an attachment, it's about this big, it whispers into your ear the page of the book that you're reading, the street sign, the banknote in your hand, the goods on the supermarket shelf. Okay? Unbelievable. 2% of the world's population is blind, and then uh, another percent or two are visually impaired. Unbelievable. But now, I ask you to put on an impact lens. If you wanted to use that technology, to help the greatest number of people in need in the world, what would the answer be? Any guesses? You do the blind. Is there another group of people that could use this technology? Sorry? The elderly, okay, who have difficulty reading, good. <laughs> Illiterates. 800 million illiterate people in the world. Imagine you give a pair of spectacles that enable somebody to read. What does that do for their life? What does it do for the economy in which they're in? And what does it do for you as a provider of a product? Now, if all of a sudden, instead of having a 200 million person market, you have a billion person market, what type of a business model does that lead you to? I mean, certainly one where you can make a lot more money uh, than uh, if you just focused on a market a quarter of, of the size. So that would be optimizing risk, return, and impact. And the social impact bond becomes significant because it did just that. Uh, the first social impact bond, in which we, Rockefeller, and I, and others invested, ended up reducing the number of convictions among young prisoners leaving Peterborough Jail by 9.1% and paying 3.1% a year to investors on top of their money. That is optimizing risk, return, and impact. And then I'll, I'll just close, because this is supposed to be a fireside chat, and I've hogged uh, the platform for a long time. When you talk in terms of capitalism changing, that's what it's going to change to. We're going to begin to measure not just the financial performance of companies, we're going to measure the impact performance in the same set of accounts. Within five years, we will see generally accepted impact principles. Initially, like financial principles, which came in after the 1930 crash, at which time 
Every company picked its own accountant and its own accounting policies, and no comparisons were dependable. The same thing is going to happen with impact. We're going to start with generally accepted impact principles, and they're going to say, you measure product impact in this way, and it changes the sales line. We're going to measure employment impact in this way, and it's going to move up or down your cost lines. And we're going to measure environmental impact in this way, and that too is going to affect your bottom line. And so we will look at the accounts of a company and say, these two companies each made a billion dollars, but this tobacco company that made a billion dollars on an impact-weighted basis had a negative contribution, a loss of one and a half billion. And this company, which is selling the Orcam uh, spectacles, uh, is making five billion dollars of profit. And investors and employees and consumers will then be able to judge the impact performance of companies together with their financial performance. In my view, that is how capitalism is going to change because that is the way of bringing the private sector in, not just preventing it from creating negative consequences as is happening with ESG, environmental, social and governance investing today, but actually harnessing the entrepreneurship and innovation of the private sector to help governments find solutions to social and environmental issues. Well, thank you very much. It's a wonderful start. Um, I'd like to ask one more question before I know that Professor Ito will have a, a broad conception around these issues. But on this, just this last point, when you say in five years we'll have these measures, uh, I, Sometimes I worry that there are, uh, uh, you know, there are too many different groups coming up with too many different metrics, um, and and um, so I wonder, and some of them are, uh, you know, proprietary firms for which you, you know, would 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 have to pay to sort of comply, and it's sort of moving into a compliance mode, as against uh, uh, really an analytical. Uh, kind of investigation on how do you develop metrics that are really meaningful and 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 get at the core values. I, I just wonder when you say that, if you could just say one more thing before I hand it over, where you think these metrics will come from? So, today these metrics exist for environmental. Okay. Uh, there is a market for carbon credits, so you and, and companies are reporting increasingly on the tons of CO2 that they're putting into the atmosphere. Um, and so it's easy to look at a company, measure its CO2 emissions, value them, and to the extent that they are above a certain level, add that cost to the normal operating cost of the company. When it comes to employment, there's quite a lot of information, less than in environmental, uh, about the value of a job in a particular country. Now, the value of a job varies from country to country, and there are some big conceptual uh, decisions to be made about how you value it. But the tools exist already to be able to say, this company created a thousand jobs in an underserved part of the United States, and that's worth so much. This company created so many jobs in Africa, in a rural area, and that's worth so much. And of course, with big data existing today and computing power and so on and so forth, the task is much easier to gather this information and, and process it. The biggest challenge is product impact because measuring the impact of, um, of a product involves value for money, affordability, and then an improvement, an improvement in lives. And 
if you take a, a pharmaceutical company, um, the claim that all pharmaceutical companies deliver impact uh, is correct. But if uh, the particular drug costs 300,000 pounds and only 5,000 patients can, um, can benefit from it a year, uh, the impact is going to end up being very narrow. And so there will be accounting rules for saying, well, the impact is so many individuals improved lives and it's so much. And if you have a generic drug at a tenth of the cost selling throughout Africa or India in huge quantities, uh, obviously the impact will be a lot uh, greater. For many products, I have an intuition that uh, we will be using big data uh, to measure product impact in some way. Mm -hmm. Consumers will be giving us a view about uh, the value to them uh, of a particular product. Now, it's nascent. Uh, there'll be a lot of innovation. I can't predict today um, you know how how we will uh, we will do it, uh, but maybe some of the minds in you know in this hall uh, will address the issue and help us get to to the answer. So, I think we have to view it as a process where there is a an accounting board, an impact accounting board that works with the accounting houses. Uh, and makes decisions about accounting policies. Mm -hmm. And we've had um, nine decades uh, for financial accounts to develop a very sophisticated uh, financial accounting system, which, by the way, still leaves huge room for negotiation and judgment um, on issues like recognition of uh, income for a software company which is uh, signing up uh, maintenance agreements that won't cost much to service. Do you take the profit at the time of signature? Do you take it on a yearly basis? There are still huge debates uh, around, uh, based on judgment of what is appropriate. And we cannot expect impact accounting um, to deliver even more than financial accounting. Very often, I find when um, when people um, discuss impact accounting, they put the bar even higher, like they want to measure every aspect of, of every possible aspect of impact. Uh, but financial accounts don't give you a sense of how well a company is going to do in the future. And so trying to measure long-term aspects of impact goes beyond what financial accounts do. So I think what will happen is that we will use financial accounts as a template and we will have a gradual process of establishing rules and when we get to thorny issues about, uh, uh, we were talking of human rights um, uh, earlier, uh, then there will be footnotes to the impact accounts uh, saying uh, while this company's product and operations have had the following impact. It's human rights impact in terms of it, uh, the value of its, uh, uh, the way it stands up for, uh, I mean, diversity and labor would be in it. Child labor would also be in the accounts. But its advocacy of rights mm -hmm. uh, hasn't been taken into account. And investors will then try to make up their own uh, views, their own minds um, on, on the, what is worth. So for me, it's uh, totally in the same way that the social impact bond uh, was an answer that we hadn't thought of, but we knew that it was possible. This is totally achievable. The process has started. It's a project incubated at Harvard Business School. I hope Columbia can be involved uh, in it. It's an open source uh, project. It's led by a professor of accounting who is as convinced that it's possible as I am, called uh, Professor George Seraphim. Um, 
And like uh, risk analysis, um, academia is going to provide us with the tools for this, some of the tools, certainly. Thank you very much. Professor Ito. Thank you. Um, as um, Merit um, uh, introduced me, that I, I'm uh, an economist, straight mainstream economist. And um, so I'm, I'm going to talk from the econ econ economics uh, framework. And um, to confess, I was um, a total skeptic uh, of this uh, ESG and, and um, social um, uh, impact um, bond and and, and uh, impact investing um, um, in general 12 months ago. And so by accident, I teach this impact investing uh, course this semester. And you know, teaching is the best way to learn. So um, I'm now half converted to a uh, impact investing. So let me, so what I have been doing is try to understand uh, what the, those um, ESG impact investing other um, initiatives um, uh, prod and, and um, um, uh, those ideas, try to understand them from economics framework. And uh, we, we do have the, um, uh, we do have the, um, the um, uh, solutions to a environmental problem, uh, social problem, and um, uh, those externality problem. If we have those ownership of the uh, uh, environment and uh, other social uh, uh, goods um, identified or given endowed and uh, price it properly and the information is uh, is uh, complete and perfect the pro so, so we we think that we have all the problems solved theoretically but of course the in in reality it's uh, it's uh, there, there are many difficult problems and um, uh, that that's where uh, we have been struggling to come up with the um, uh, uh, empirical and um, uh, practical solutions to the problem. But we do think that we, we know how to address those um, uh, social problems. And we have the literature on uh, asymmetric information, asymmetric information problem, free rider problem, and um, uh, internalizing uh, externality problem and how to find uh, uh, true um, uh, willingness to pay problems. Um, so um, we thought it was just an implementation uh, problem and the government can solve them. Now, um, I think as uh, uh, Sir Ronald uh, mentioned, government is hopelessly, um, uh, hopelessly um, uh, uh, the distorted um, in in their incentives and and uh, governance structure. So maybe we cannot wait that government becomes perfect. And uh, here that I think there is there are ways that private sector can either um, 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 replace the government in these uh, uh, efforts to solve the social problem, or probably better to work with uh, government to find ways to accelerate the, uh, uh, the solution. So um, um, how to make those, um, um, uh, apply those, uh, uh, what we know, we think, we know the solutions to those uh, social problems, public goods, externalities, and, 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 and others. Uh, in the framework of this um, uh, uh, private and, and, and public sector uh, uh, projects. I think that's the um, uh, interesting, viable uh, way of thinking, um, uh, thinking about the uh, problem. So um, as uh, it was mentioned that uh, yes, government is, um, it has a low appetite for the risk, yes, and, and um, uh, the the bureaucrats are afraid of um, uh, uh, failure, uh, so they, they wouldn't experiment. Um, th that's true, and also I, I might add those politicians are 
uh, uh, living in the election cycle. So uh, those short-termism is uh, evident. So all those failure of the government, I think, would justify those involvement from and pressure from the private sector. So that's that's my half converted opinions. Um, and um, um, so my qu so let me ask a couple of questions. Uh, I I think the um, there is um, uh, uh, I think in Asia. Uh, Japan and Asia, China, Japan, China, Southeast Asia, Korea, all those Asian region, I think there is still low recognition of uh, this uh, impact investing or um, ESG is just catching on uh, now. So I, I, I was trying to think what, what is this difference between Europe and US, Europe and, and, and Asia? And um, um, one of my students uh, from Asia uh, told me that uh, there's still um, uh, hope and trust in government in Asia. Uh, so <laughs> maybe you can uh, put um, uh, you know, the pressure on the uh, politicians and, and government may come up with the uh, uh, solution. I, I think they, they are still hoping for that. Um, so I, I'd like to ask you the geographical difference in the reception of this um, uh, impact investing ideas. And second is that you emphasized, um, yes, there is a returns, and there is, if you diversify, uh, if the big funds have the diversified portfolio, it makes sense to invest in uh, this social um, uh, um, investment uh, bond, that which could be high risk, high return, but you know, Putting 1% of this big public pension fund would make sense from the uh, diverse, uh, in, uh, diversified portfolio uh, standpoint. So um, uh, the, do you think this, this will pass this uh, fiduciary duty uh, constraints, especially very hard in, in the US compared to Europe? So uh, fiduciary duty, uh, how would you um, overcome? That's a, those are two questions. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. Very good uh, questions. <coughs> uh, on the first one, um, in South Korea, <coughs> there is a very vibrant group of people <coughs> pushing this. Uh, in India, there's a very vibrant group. In Japan, the head of the uh, Japan Pension Fund <coughs> is completely um, onside. So I think it'll get the model will get adapted, but it does hinge on people at the end of the day who believe in this and who who promote it. Uh, we have a lot of interest from China, uh, Singapore. Um, Malaysia, um, unexpected uh, places, really, Indonesia. One of the answers to how quickly governments will pick this up <coughs> comes back to the social impact bond. Because the social impact bond is a pay for success instrument. And pay for success is very significant for government. Imagine if government only paid for what works. Right? That's what pay for success is about. <clears throat> you only pay for a social impact bond when you've achieved uh, the result. The delivery risk goes to the investor. The investor looks at this and says, I'm only looking at delivery risk. There's no risk I won't get paid if I achieve the numbers. Compare it to venture capital, where you have product, market, management, competition, technology risk. It's a much easier investment decision. So if government decides that it makes it more efficient, to shift to pay for success, it will attract investment money 
And the investment category is a very interesting one because apart from the ease of analysis, the evidence is only from one uh, impact bond fund, admittedly, that if you have a diversified portfolio, one in 20 of these bonds will not pay out. So then you look at the portfolio of bonds like a bond. And as you were saying, Professor, Peter, if you have 1% of your bond portfolio in a higher yielding bond of this kind, the risk is minimal, but you're talking nearly a trillion dollars across, um, across the world. So government could attract a trillion dollar of investment and pay only when things are successful, opening the door to innovation and experimentation in tackling social, um, social issues. So if Asian governments begin to be focused on the efficiency of government, strangely enough, they may well end up going in this direction. Now here in the United States, $100 million was in the last budget to pay for outcomes. And in uh, the UK, about 400 million pounds, 500 million dollars is already in outcomes funds. And if I may, I'd like just to mention, if you take, um, mention two things, one involving India, the other involving Africa, let's take the issue of education. Every single one of us in this room would say this is one of the best way of improving people's lives. That's why we're all here, improving our own lives. Imagine that you want to bring systemic improvement to education in Africa or in India. And compare putting another billion dollars of aid or philanthropic contribution with creating a billion dollar outcomes fund, professionally managed, that pays out so much for a, a girl from an urban environment or a rural environment with an infirmity, um, and a boy from an urban environment, again, the same categories, different amounts, giving incentives, pay for blind students who graduate primary school, secondary school, maybe using the OCAM product to help them learn. When you put the outcomes fund, well, who thinks that if you put a billion dollars to pay out signing contracts with delivery organizations, we will pay you so much. And on the basis of these contracts, the delivery organizations go to impact bond funds and say, look, I have a plan here. I'm going to improve the lives of 500,000 girls that are currently dropping out of schools. I'm going to get paid $30 million if I do that. I need $15 million in order to do it. Will you, the Impact Bond Fund, give me $15 million? You stand to make 10% on, uh, on the money for your investors. It doesn't go up and down with the stock market, so it's very attractive. And I, the not-for-profit, will hold on to 20% of the gain, building up my ability to help others. So that's what a billion um, dollar outcome fund does. A billion dollar of aid, we all know what it does, or a billion dollar of philanthropy. Who would put the money in aid or philanthropy among you? Anyone? Anyone think that's a better way to, to do, to continue doing what we are? Well, how many would put it in the outcomes fund? Will you raise your hands? Hi. <laughs> so we can see them. And the rest of you would do nothing. Uh, so we have to try these new, we have to try these new ways. And what's attractive about it? is government in Africa might put 15% of the money in to the outcomes fund. 
The rest would come from aid organizations and philanthropists who again only pay if it worked, okay? So it should be a no-brainer for foundations um, to say, if we want to shift education, let's go this way. We know, our, you know, we know our money is being effective. We're not taking a risk of a failure uh, uh, in it. What's more important about it, though, and this comes back, say, to education in India, in Asia, which is a massive issue, massive population too. If you, with that billion, attract 700 million of impact bond funds, and the average size of an impact bond is, you know, seven, to, for simplicity's sake, seven million dollars, that's 100 impact bonds experimenting from early childhood education through primary school, secondary school, tertiary education, vocational training, getting into jobs. It creates for government evidence-based solutions which government can roll out. And so, I, I, mean, I would ask you the question because you, you understand um, Asia much better than I do. What is, the, uh, what is the button to press with government so that it begins to shift to pay for success? Well, I, I think the, uh, it's very difficult to, s uh, that was, you know, it, it's wrong to ask, answering question by asking back, but the um, um, success fee, success pay, how to set it is a very difficult question. And for the education, there is a personal returns and there is a society social returns. And how to uh, decompose those returns into those um, uh, 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 two, two components is very difficult. If the government is doing for everybody, then um, uh, that tax, tax payers' money uh, can be justified. But you know, granted that uh, India and Africa, uh, they, they, ha they have been uh, failures, so um, uh, those new initiatives could work. Uh, but other parts of the Asia, I think education in at least the, um, the elementary and the secondary uh, educations have been good in the sense the literacy rate is uh, high. And um, uh, so I, I, don't, I don't think this um, uh, education impact um, social impact bond would sell. Um, other things, the environment is a different matter. I think there are a lot of interests um, uh, in it. So how to set the, uh, the success fee is... Uh, okay. yeah, so, so there's already a first answer to that. In the UK, in 2014, <coughs> the government published the cost of 600 social issues the cost to the government. It doesn't take into account the value to society. That already provides you with a very clear way of saying, if you achieve the results, the government saved money. Economists can then do numbers and say, well, you know, that's very conservative because you add to that the lifetime earnings of a prisoner uh, who instead of sitting in a cell is productively employed. You, you can add that to it. But the evidence so far with the social impact bond is that during the life of the bond, this is based on 40 impact bonds in, well, 20 in the Bridges Fund out of 40 in the UK. Within the life of the bond, the government saves twice what it pays out. Twice what it pays out. So it's a bit of a, you know, it's a bit of a non-brainer, a no-brainer. Um, I think in places like India, where you have a law that says um, companies have to give 2% of the profit to philanthropy, you could imagine that 2% flowing into outcomes funds instead of just going in donations. And that is what we're trying to do to persuade the government to allow this money to flow into outcomes funds. Because, and they understand it, you create a market for outcomes. 
you get price discovery for an intervention, mm -hmm. what it's worth paying for an intervention. You get competing service providers with different costs of intervention. There's a very valuable mechanism that is engendered for this. So I think we need to show the way, we being the private sector and philanthropists and aid organizations, for governments to follow. They're not going to lead, uh, but we can lead. So Ronald, uh, time is so short. I think I know we have a hard stop in just uh, about five minutes, but so that you at least hear what's on people's minds, may I just invite uh, a question uh, or two, and then uh, uh, you may or may not have time to answer, but just so you hear Please. what, what uh, our community is at least thinking about, um, should there be such a pressing uh, interest. So why don't we start right here. If you would, wouldn't mind going to the mic, we can all hear you. And if there's anyone on this side, go. Thank you very much for uh, the talk. I really enjoyed it. My question would be, impact investing has been known um, for a while now, for some years now but still many venture capitalists or private equity investors don't really know about it and feel skeptic about it. So what would your recommendation be to make impact investing more mainstream um, than what it is right now? May I collect one more for you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, actually I've been writing this book on sustainable finance you know, for which impact investing is one of the main uh, chapters. But in it, I actually have a lot of questions to discuss, but you know, in, in the interest of time, I'll just ask one. Uh, you probably have already heard this argument, you know, especially from the academia. You know, there's a suspicion that impact investing doesn't probably won't pass the master of uh, the additionality test, right? If we're talking about converting the private investors, uh, then sort of, you know, it's sort of uh, difficult to say to them that you're not making non-concessionary uh, non investments, right? Uh, in that case, are we really talking about foundations, going back to the philanthropists, uh, asking them to make uh, concessionary investments uh, instead of you know, sort of thinking the investors, they can make non-concessionary uh, investment because the examples you give, uh, you know, you're making above market returns in any case. Okay. So that <coughs> really echoes of the same question in a way. So uh, the answer with regard to the private uh, <coughs> equity and venture capital industries is investors are driving it. Um, uh, if you look at uh, <coughs> uh, the TPG, which raised two billion, and then was in the process of raising three billion, um, five billion dollars in two years oversubscribed. Why? because pension fund investors are under pressure from their pensioners to bring the portfolios in line with the values of the pensioners. I don't think the existing firms are all going to convert. I think new firms with the DNA that is required, like Bridges Ventures, Avishkar in India, Leapfrog uh, in Africa, are going to be the ones that will end up winning in that area. However, KKR, Partners Group, Bain Capital, TPG, and others are creating entities in the hope that they can manage to develop something which maybe over time influences um, the rest of their investment. If I were in the impact, um, if I were starting today in the venture capital private uh, equity industry, I would do it as impact venture capital private equity. I would shift the whole of the portfolio today <coughs> to impact. And you would get better returns and you would also um, raise more capital. Then on the issue of additionality, 
I sometimes think the issue of additionality is worrying about a very sophisticated concept when the issues staring us in the face require significant capital. So if I bring today um, a billion dollars of philanthropic money into an outcomes fund, okay, it may not be additional, but if I use it to attract a billion dollars of investment opposite, which is going to circulate all the way around, that billion dollar of, of, of philanthropic money will have much bigger leverage, whether it was additional or whether it wasn't. And so for me, the issue of additionality is, a, is an important issue. But at this stage of uh, development of the sector, it isn't a necessary one in, in deciding whether you support an, an impact approach or not. The key is what leverage do you bring? Um, if the leverage is greater than you would get through traditional philanthropy, then it's worth doing. This has been a wonderful start to a conversation. I hope you'll come back. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Please join me in thanking Sir Ronald for being here.